Welcome to this video from the Consultants Development Institute. I'm Carter McNamara, an instructor with the Institute and the presenter in this video that is included in the CDI course, Understanding Yourself as Consultant. Let's look at the outcomes that we're aiming for in this video. We'll begin by describing the typical nature of the change process in organizations so that you get a feel for the personal role that you'll have in it. That information about change also is useful for you to describe to your clients when you start consulting with them. Then we'll discuss how you are what many consultants refer to an instrument of change. That is, how even your personal nature changes your client even when you first meet. So it's very important for you now to really understand your nature and how it affects others. Then we'll help you to learn even more about yourself, including about your consulting style and your biases. Consultants have different styles that they naturally prefer, and you should be able to describe yours to your clients. Also, we all have biases or different ways of seeing and interpreting the world, and it's very important for us to realize the effects that our biases have on others. It's also very important for you to realize your natural perspective on organizations. Two people can look at the same organization and see it and not see it very differently because each has a naturally different perspective. You'll learn what yours is during this video. We'll help you to clarify your natural responses to feedback and conflict. In your consulting projects, you should continually be asking your client for feedback, and if you do your job well, you might encounter conflict as people become resistant to the changes that are needed for success in their organizations. So this information about feedback and conflict is very important for you to understand now. Also, it's extremely important for all consultants to understand at least the basics about emotional intelligence. That is, to recognize their own emotions and the emotions of others and how to respond to those emotions. Projects to solve complex problems and accomplish significant change can evoke strong emotions in your clients and even within yourself. And last, we'll share some best practices for you when working with your clients to guide them through change in their organizations. If you don't take care of yourself, you won't be good at helping to take care of others along the journey of change. So let's talk about the nature of the overall change process, and then we'll talk more about your role in it. This description will be useful to you, especially during projects to solve complex problems and accomplish significant change, because you should be able to describe the typical change process to your clients. Regardless of the type of organization, each change process with each client is different. It is highly unique and customized to the client. As much as friendships are unique, so is each change process. Experienced consultants have learned to consider each of the unique features of each client's organization. Rarely can one consulting project be implemented in exactly the same way in all organizations all the time. Next, a change process is rarely an aha experience. During the process, you and your client continually collaborate to share expertise, wisdom, and reflections, the results of which determine what the next wise action will be in the project. So during the process, you both need to be open to changing your plans as you continue to learn about how best to change your client's organization. Change is a process, not an event. The change process usually takes longer than you think. Experts assert that successful change requires a change to the culture of the organization. Cultural change can be like changing someone's personality. It's not done overnight. That's why it's so important to sustain momentum during change. There's much more information about how to do that in an upcoming CDI course, Guiding Change in Organizations. Finally, a change process is a journey that you and your client take together. And the change process rarely occurs in a predictable, step-by-step -step fashion. Instead, there are usually surprises along the way. For example, various action plans get changed, or there is different emphasis on different aspects of the process. So it helps to view the process as a mutual journey rather than as an implementation of specific action plans. Near the end of this video, we'll share some key personal development guidelines for maximizing your effectiveness as a change agent that is, as a person or group, to guide your client through a project for change. Now that you've heard about the overall change process, we'll talk even more now about how you are an instrument of change in that process, many times without even knowing it. The field of organization development refers to consultants who are working to accomplish significant change in organizations as instruments of change. 
That's because those consultants are continually affecting or changing their clients and their clients' organizations just by being themselves. There are numerous ways that you affect your client right away when you first meet them. For example, clients might automatically open up to you and begin sharing information with you, especially if they sense that you are an open and honest person yourself. That's the reaction that you do want from them, of course. Or they might feel a bit intimidated and defensive, especially if you seem a bit aloof and overly inquisitive. That's not the reaction that you want from them. Your clients promptly have an effect on you, and maybe you don't realize it. For example, if a client has a strong personality, then you might feel a bit insecure and defensive at first. If so, that will be apparent to your clients, and they don't want that from you. Or if a client seems warm and engaging, then you might act the same way. They do want that from you. So it's very important to learn more about yourself as a consultant so that you know the effect that you're having on your clients and the effect they're having on you. Learn about your natural consulting style, your own biases about the world, and how you handle feedback and conflict. The guidelines throughout this video are intended to help you to do just that. In the CDI course, Primary Methods and Myths in Consulting, we talked about the primary methods that consultants use, and we mentioned that many people see those methods as styles. One of the styles is giving advice, that is, acting as an expert. The expert consultant typically, not always, prefers to work alone. His focus is on the facts and events in the client's organization, and his primary tool is his expert advice. The expert consultant is especially good at technical consulting and training, for example, helping clients to plan and develop computer systems or develop various management practices such as marketing and finances. Is the expert style your natural and preferred style of consulting? That earlier course about consulting methods includes many guidelines for effectively giving advice during consulting. The collaborator style is more like the coach and facilitator roles that we discussed in that previous course about methods. The collaborator prefers to work with others her focus is primarily on the human relationships in organizations, and her primary tool is coaching and facilitating because those tools cultivate the understanding, commitment, and participation needed from clients during change. That's why the coaching and facilitator styles are often best in projects to accomplish long-lasting change in organizations. Is the collaborator style your natural and preferred style of consulting? Again. The earlier course on methods gives key guidelines for coaching and facilitating. We all have biases. For each of us, some biases are much stronger than others. Yours plays a major role in how you perceive your clients and their organizations and how you react to them as well. So as a consultant, you should know your biases and recognize the effects on your clients. For example, do you inherently believe that leaders should always take charge and lead from the front? Even if you don't always say so, if so, your client might sense that in you, and so you sometimes might encounter their defensiveness and resistance when working with you, especially if they believe that leaders should lead from the middle. So read about other theories and styles of leadership to better understand what your clients might believe about you. The free management library, referenced from the sidebar in CDI's learning management system, has plenty of information about leadership. Do you inherently believe that clients really should just shut up and listen to you? If so, you might find that your clients are being rather defensive and even a bit hostile towards you because perhaps they are not feeling respected by you. If this is a bias of yours, then read about the methods of coaching and facilitating consulting, including by re-reviewing information in the CDI course Primary Methods and Myths in Consulting. Do you believe that meetings should always start and end on time? If so, you will certainly be frustrated with people from different cultures who place far less value on being on time, and your frustration might show to your client whether you realize it or not. Again, the free management library listed on the side of the CDI's learning management system includes a topic about working with diversity. Read some of the articles about that topic. Do you believe and sometimes convey your belief that your country and culture are always the best? If so, you might struggle to accept the beliefs and practices of others who are not from your country, and your struggle might be so apparent to your clients that they might feel misunderstood and even judged by you. The above-mentioned articles about diversity can be helpful here, too. 
And do you believe that your particular political views are always more right than others? If so, your clients might sense a bit of self-righteousness in you and become somewhat irritable and disgusted with you. Again, read about diversity. Better yet, if you can afford it, do some international travel. That's the best way to realize that there are many different cultures and ways of governing in countries. What other biases might you have and how might they affect you and your clients? Discuss them with others whom you trust and ask them to be honest with you about what they see as your biases. The Free Management Library also includes a topic on personal development that includes self-assessments to learn even more about yourself. And the handouts for this video include a set of guidelines to help you recognize and manage the effects of your biases. The handouts are available from CDI's management system. Now is a good time to stop and reflect on what you've heard so far. In your learning journal, in the section entitled, During the Video in the Course, write down your answers to the following questions. What is your preferred style of consulting? Is it expert or collaborator? What adjustments might you need to do in that order uh, to be even more effective as a consultant? And what are some of your biases and, and how might they be affecting others around you? What adjustments might you need to make here too? You can pause the video by clicking on the button in the bottom left-hand corner of this video. After you've written in your journal, then you can resume the video by clicking on that same button again. What are the most common reasons that consultants and clients might argue about the best approaches to change is because different people can see the same organization from very different perspectives. Therefore, it's critical that each consultant understands his or, or her own perspective and be very sensitive to those of others. One of the best resources to explain this is the book Reframing Organizations by Bowman and Deal. The authors depict four different perspectives. The structural perspectives sees primarily the business side of organizations. For example, their goals, objectives, roles, responsibilities, uh, performance, they focus on policies and procedures and efficiency, hierarchy. You get the, my, gist, my gist there. But in contrast, the human resource perspective sees primarily the people side of organizations. For example, matters of feelings and fulfillment, communication, people's needs, relationships, motivation, and so on. The political perspective sees primarily matters of power. For example, conflict, competition, authority, uh, coalitions, bargaining, and so on. The symbolic perspective sees primarily matters of culture. For example, the organization's rituals, values, stories, different perspectives, uh, language, myths, and so on. The best consultants strive to see organizations from all four perspectives. So what is your natural perspective on organizations? The more you understand your own perspective, the more successful you will be in understanding and communicating with your clients about theirs. You might even mention the four perspectives to your clients and then ask them to identify theirs. The handouts for this video also include a set of guidelines to help you remember the different perspectives and what each tends to look like in an organization. Your client should be open to receiving feedback, whether the feedback is about their organization and its problems or even about the role that your client plays in those problems. In turn, you should be open to feedback about the project and your role in it. So consider, does feedback sometimes leave you feeling defensive and uncomfortable? You can feel that way, but you don't have to act that way. Even if you feel threatened, frustrated, or angry about the feedback, you can remind yourself that the feedback is not necessarily directed at you personally. One of the best ways to know the effects of your consulting on your clients is to get their open and honest feedback about you. It's actually a gift. Do you receive it that way? If not, you might practice getting feedback about yourself, even if from peers. And again, the Free Management Library has advice about that. This video also includes a handout to help you manage your responses to feedback. What is your response to conflict? For example, do you avoid it? The more effective you are at focusing on the real causes of problems in clients' organizations, the more likely there'll be conflict when resolving those problems. That's because people are confronted with changing themselves, and that often produces conflict within themselves and sometimes even within you. 
And conflict is not inherently bad. Problems can come from how the conflict is addressed. If you try to ignore it, or somehow to just shut it down, then it will surface again. Either as yet more confrontation to you, or worse, in more indirect ways. For example, the client just quits working with you and doesn't say why. In an upcoming CDI course, Building Trust, Commitment, and Collaboration, we'll talk about what to do in that situation. But for now, how do you respond to feedback and conflict? The handout about feedback includes guidelines for dealing with both. And again, the Free Management Library has information on these topics. Emotional intelligence is the ability to recognize our emotions and the emotions of others and to manage our responses in a way that enhances our health and the health of our relationships with others. Emotional intelligence is extremely important in consulting, especially when working in very challenging projects that might evoke strong emotions among those involved. To examine your emotional intelligence, consider the following basic questions. Can you usually recognize what you are feeling? For example, is it mad, glad, sad, or bad, or other emotions as well? The more you can recognize your own emotions, the more effective you'd be at managing responding to them as well. Do you judge any of those emotions? For example, some people might judge sadness as somehow being weak or not being in charge. The more you understand your own judgments about various emotions, the more you can manage your emotions and even accept those and others as well. What evokes certain emotions in you? The more you recognize those situations, the more you can predict how you will feel in different situations in consulting, and accordingly, the more you can discern what you might do about them. Do you notice the feelings of others? Some people are oblivious to those feelings of others. The more that you can recognize those emotions, the more you can understand and relate to others as well, and the more effectively you can successfully support and guide them through change. Can you accurately recognize what others are feeling? Different people show the same emotions in very different ways. For example, in some regions, men are very reserved and stoic. It's very difficult to discern if they're angry or just feeling very serene. The more you can recognize what others are feeling, the more you can effectively support and guide them as well. What is your response to strong emotions in others? Quite often, your own emotions that you struggle with the most are the same emotions that you struggle with in others. So those emotions will need special attention from you when consulting. You might see the topic emotional intelligence in the free management library for more help. So far, we've talked about the nature of the change process and your role in it, including your natural consulting style, your biases, your natural way of looking at organizations, how you respond to feedback and conflict, and your own emotional intelligence. Now let's look at where your information about yourself fits into some best practices for you when guiding change. First, be sure to manage your time and stress. Perhaps this is the most important guideline for you to follow because if you become stressed out, your perspective on everything else suffers, including what you see about your clients and their organizations. Be authentic with yourself and others. That means respectfully and tactfully being open and honest in the moment, hopefully without hurting yourself or others. For example, if your, core, if your client is not showing up on time to meetings, then tell your client, we had agreed on a ground rule of timeliness. You've been late in our last two meetings. Can I help with that somehow? It's extremely important to recognize your effect on others. As we talked about, your very nature is an instrument of change. So you should know how you use that instrument, including how it might affect others during the change process. That's what much of this video has been about so far. And always, adhere to your own personal values. If you lose your moral compass during a project, then your perspective on everything else suffers, especially during a complex and dynamic change process. The previous CDI course, Standards, Principles, and Risks in Consulting, shared many guidelines to ensure that you always consult ethically. It's important to use at least one explicit systematic consulting model that you can reference especially when explaining the nature of change to your clients and to show, you, show your client where you are now in that, that process. The earlier CDI course, Roles, Goals, and Reasons in Consulting, mentioned that there's different approaches to consulting. For example, the organic approach and the systematic approach. 
You might even take CDI's program, Organizational Consulting, to develop skills in systematic consulting. Let's look at more guidelines for you as a change agent. As much as possible, collaborate with your client during the project. That is, work together almost as if you were partners during the project. Successful, long-lasting change requires your client to implement the plans for change and to learn at the same time. In turn, that requires the ongoing understanding, commitment, and participation of your client. You'll get that in the collaborative consulting approach. The upcoming CDI course, Collaborative Consulting for Performance, Change, and Learning, shares many guidelines for collaborative consulting. Network with colleagues and peers to enhance your effectiveness and learning about consulting. For example, get a mentor or join a group of fellow consultants to get their fresh, ongoing perspectives. Otherwise, you can fall into a rut of always doing your consulting in the same way with every client, but as we've learned, each client is different. Know the other sources of assistance for yourself and your client. For example, if the project needs a specialist in boards of directors or marketing or finances, then know where to find that expertise. Worst of all, don't pretend that you somehow have that expertise yourself. Build skills in coaching and facilitation. These practices are very effective for bringing out the commitment, participation, and learning of others. All of that's critical during the journey of change. The resources for consulting listed on the side of the page in the Learning Management System includes a bibliography of very good books about coaching and facilitation. And last, don't try to always control the change process. Instead, work with your client to guide the process. Plans will change as you and your client continue to learn and to take actions along the way. Let the plans change, but change them systematically, and then communicate those changes to the relevant stakeholders in the project. It's important for you as a consultant during the long journey of change that we've talked about to know what really motivates you. I'm going to be quiet for a moment while you look at some of the items here on the slide. And for those of you listening to this on a mobile device, I'm just going to mention some. And there's a handout that lists these various motivators. And you can use that handout with yourself or with your clients to even discern what really motivates them. For example, are you motivated by career development and success? What about primarily seeking more comfort or relaxation? Some people want more health, more balance in their life, while others want to primarily influence and, and be leaders that way. Some people like learning, more knowledge, more discovery, while some want more materials and possessions. There's also recognition and praise as a motivator. Uh, and then there's always the standard security, money, getting a house, while some want more of social affiliation, maybe more popularity or acceptance that way. But then there's status and prestige. Uh, some people just want to get something done, like solving a problem, uh, doing more on their to-do list. And then there's teaching, guiding others. But if you're going to tend to some or all of these, then there's another motivator, and that's vitality and, and energy. It's important now to pause for a reflection again, based on what you've heard, and ask yourself an answer in your journal. What is your natural perspective on organizations? Which one of those four perspectives is it, and how might you need to adjust? How do you naturally respond to feedback and conflict? And also there, what might you need to do to accommodate your approach and your clients? Because feedback and conflict are both critical elements of the change process. And thank you for attending this video. We hope that you'll finish the rest of the elements in the course. If you ever have any questions or want to share feedback about the series, simply send us an email at info at consultantsdevelopmentinstitute.org. Again, thank you for your time during this video.